Lincoln Riley did a lot of talking over the last eight months, especially in lead-up to the draft. And one of the things that I found most interesting about what he had to say was when he went on LA 570 AM to talk about what specifically he looks for in quarterbacks. Now, this is from February when he's speaking freely. There's no football for him to actually coach, and there's no quarterback for him to choose. And that's when I'm thinking he hit. perhaps he's protesting too much. So, Lincoln, do you need, like, a big arm yeah, to be— big arm. Go ahead. Yeah, the big arm doesn't matter a whole lot. I mean, I, that doesn't come into play a ton. I, I mean, physically, what we look for, the number one thing we look for is are they accurate? They've got to be accurate, and they've got to be a good enough athlete. They're not always going to be Kyler Murray's. There's, there's, you know, there's only one of those out there. Uh, but they've got to be good enough athletically. Uh, the biggest thing we look for, though, is it was a guy a winner. I mean, it's and at the end of the day, if you're a good enough high school player then your team, as a quarterback, your team's going to win. And you may not win the state championship. You may not have all the other best players on your team, but you're going to win. And that's one thing Baker and Kyler both had in common. That's all they've ever done is win. And you can, you know, and, and that's, I think, a trait that becomes expected. And, and I think you, you can just tell so much out of, out of a guy that gets the most out of his teammates and finds a way to win and finds a way to play his best in big moments. And so we really try to evaluate those things hard and, and uh, get to know the kids. And, you know, luckily we had two guys like that that came in and have done well. And But it, that's kind of set the stage here for more great ones uh, here in the future. This is Lincoln Riley talking about what it takes to play physically and mentally as quarterback at Oklahoma. And I thought that was really well done, one. And two, he put four of those guys in the quarterback room with him. We all know about Jalen Hurts and being 26-2 and as the starter at Alabama and leading not just team to a national championship, but people forget he beat that Clemson team in 2016, right? They're, they're really good. And then you're talking about Spencer Rattler, who all he did at Pinnacle was win state championships, Elite 11, best quarterback in the 2019 class. Tanner Mordecai at Waco Midway led his team all the way there. They didn't, they didn't win the state championship, but their best season in years. And then, of course, Tanner Schaefer, walk-on guy out of Canadian in Texas, 2A, state title. That dude absolutely can play. So he has given himself options to choose from when talking about do all these guys have that trait in common of what he's looking for. And whoever demonstrates those traits during camp is going to win the job. We all think it's Jalen Hurts, but I also thought that those traits and those attributes could be extended across college football as who you're looking at to play quarterback. And one of the reasons that we're all so high on Spencer Sanders is exactly the reason that he doesn't necessarily want to talk about it. He's Mr. Texas football. And the guys on that list do not include Jalen Hurts, okay? The guys on that list do not include Baker Mayfield. Guys that win Mr. Texas football are known commodities as winners. They're all state quarterbacks. They're all state players. You know, that would be my biggest reason for making Spencer Sanders my quarterback to start against Oregon State ahead of Drew Brown. Because as good as he was at Hawaii and having the career starts and knowing what it means to play at this level, he doesn't have that pedigree. Right? This guy had to go to JUCO before he could go to Hawaii and then ends up at Oklahoma State. And then you're looking at TU and you're going, man, I don't know that Zach Smith is the winner that we all wanted him to be or think he's going to be, but he certainly did beat up on a really good football team. And if you keep him healthy, which is to say you protect him, he might have the goods to be great. So, Patrick, was there anything that you found enlightening yeah. in that cut? When I, when, when, when I was editing the cut, and the things obviously that stood out, I mean, accurate, athlete, winner. Mm-hmm. I mean, those are pretty good formulas. We hear all the time about, uh, you know, I'd be interested to see – did. These guys, do they play multiple sports? We talk about that all the time, about non-specialization. Uh, I think that falls into being an athlete, and that kind of just falls into being a competitor. But, you know, I, th- I think it's interesting. Again, he talked about the accuracy. His offense is so – you have to be pinpoint. You you have to throw balls in, in small windows sometimes. you got to be quick with your throws as well. As he said, obviously the great arm um, – you, I mean, you need to have some kind of arm, but but you don't have to have a John Elway arm all the time just to be a great quarterback. You know what? I'm trying to – you know, Sam Bradford obviously had a very good arm, but he was extremely accurate. I mean, 
he had rare accuracy throwing the football. Um, Baker's I, that guy. Yeah, Baker. Baker's that guy. Rare accuracy. And again, we all know Baker. Baker is a winner. We talk about it all the time. He's 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 all the adjectives you throw in about. I hate the word moxie, but he's uh, everything else. That I'll you take throw moxie over that. arm talent. Well, yeah, okay. I, I, I just hate moxie as a buzzword. No, I, talent I think, too is 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 a buzzword. You're like, eh. You you hit you hit on something that I actually yeah. wanted to have a bigger conversation about, and I think this is a good place to do it. The kid that plays more than one sport. We talk about that quite a bit. We don't want kids to be specialists. We want them to do the one thing. And as a kid growing up in an era where people were saying, man, that kid only does the one thing, I'm going, yeah, well, I don't have a choice, okay? Because if I want to be the best at this and I want to get a scholarship to do this, Mm -hmm. I don't get to go play soccer. I don't get to Mm -hmm. go wrestle. I don't get to go play basketball or go out for those teams where I might not be that good because everybody else – is specializing like find me a AAU basketball player that is an all-state soccer player or plays baseball yeah. even mm-hmm. find me a football player yeah of course I, but by the time they get yeah. to their junior year or their senior year they're already specializing and giving up on other sports because they know that this is the thing where they have the best opportunity to do the thing that we all want to do which is go to school for free yeah or get paid I, to do what you do I said all the time but I, I think what like Jeffrey Mead did at Union was impressive that he was now he was obviously an outstanding athlete, but he played all three. I mean, that's hard to do at a place like Union. We see this now with, with the big, huge schools. We talk about Jenks, Union, Broken Arrow. When there's so many kids who, I mean, how how many kids at at Union want to play? Like legit, want to play in the basketball team? Fifty, a hundred? I mean, it's hard to 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 stay up with that if you are playing football, then going to basketball. It's it's you have to be the rare top level athlete to do that. Now you get to the smaller schools. Obviously, look just to feel the team. They need everybody. No, I, I don't. I don't want to talk about those specifically because we. I get your point there. I yeah. think you're making a, a good one with the bigger schools because that's what we're talking about. Because those are the schools where you routinely getting recruited to play. This isn't a problem at Wagner. High I mean, major Wagner football. Well, Wagner actually does have this problem. Yeah. Uh, I'm thinking perhaps Caddo does not. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right or Vanita does not. Mm-hmm. Right or mm-hmm. Vianne does not. Yeah. But if you are a class 4A, 5A, 6A school, you got this problem because kids are just good, and that's part of it. But you look at Meade as an example, right? One of the coolest things I got to do was shadow Carson Meyer and Jeffrey Meade at Union and write you know, two big features about the kids. Go to school with them, go to class with them, go to practice with them, uh, meet girlfriends, meet friends, meet parents. And the thing about Meade was, yeah, he could do all of that. He could play shortstop at 6'6". You know, he could pitch. He could hit. He was power forward, and he was an outstanding wide receiver, and they moved him there because they had a guy that could play quarterback. They did not have a guy that could do what he could do on the outside. There's one play that I watched him make where the ball was thrown basically at the goal post, and that dude went up and got it, and his head was there when he caught the football. But then ask me what he did at OU. Now, the, the, the counterpoint is, would he have been a better wide receiver at Oklahoma if he did not play shortstop? if he did not play basketball, if he would have specialized in the craft of being a wide receiver, if he would have focused on being much more of a technician. Because I'm of the opinion that if you got the talent to do it, you might need to specialize just so that you're the kid that we're talking about that plays nickel. He probably played a lot of football. He probably did not play a lot of soccer. He might have run some track because they asked him to. And I think that if you have the ability and you're confident enough to do those things, you should definitely do those things. But I also get the argument for, you know, I'm going to play football. You know, and, and I, I get that there are some kids that just can do it. But me, as a dude who met that ceiling of I can't play with this guy anymore, younger than most people, you know, there's nothing like watching Felix Jones outrun you to say, you know what I'm not going to be able to do? This. Not at the level I want to do it. So I'm going to focus on something I could be the best at. For me, that's powerlifting, right? I, I got the levers to do that. Ask a six foot six dude to push 315 pounds off his chest and be 150 pounds and do it. Ain't going to happen. You don't have the levers to do it. So don't ask me to go and play basketball when it's a vertically challenged sport for me. And I don't think that that's that. I don't, I don't think that's that how to take. I think that's just being real about who you are and what you believe. When we come back, I want to talk about what we know to be true about passing the ball versus running the ball, and you're going to be surprised which one is more efficient than the other. R.J. Young on the R.J. Young Show. Patrick Masick in the booth. One of the things I want to talk about all day and for the last couple of weeks, really, was 
this idea that running the ball or passing the ball was more efficient depending on who you were talking to. And so Mike Gundy had some really great things to say about the evolution of football, innovation in football that we're going to talk about later in this hour. But one of the things that he pointed to was, I love running the ball because if I throw the ball, I got to pass, protect, and make the catch. And then if you run the ball, you got a good back like Chuba Hubbard, you want to give it to him because you know what's probably going to happen. You're not going to lose the ball. You have guys that can down block. You know where you're going. You know what to do. You get the offense moving as one. But I was reading this book called The League by a fellow named Josh Hermsmeyer. Also writes for 538, so it's a data-centric statistical look at what NFL teams do. And he talked with a bunch of them. And he did this study where he found that passing attempts have increased year over year in nearly every season from 2009 to 2016. During that time, scoring increased by 9.2%. The increase in passing isn't the only reason that scoring has gone up, but it's played a large role. And there were more or less six, or excuse me, six, four findings that I wanted to point to that Hermsmeyer had in his study. The first one is offensive scoring in the NFL has increased over time, right? In large part because we throw the ball. The second one was the rise of passing is responsible for the increase. Again, we throw the ball. The third one is passing the ball is far more efficient than running the ball. And the fourth one is as the league has begun passing more, it has not seen a decrease in passing efficiency. Instead, teams have become more efficient at gaining yards and scoring points through the air. I feel like I've been yelling about this for a very long time, but football is less about playing smash mouth, beat people to a pulp like it was in the days of Y.A. Tittle bleeding from his forehead and Ray Nitschke yelling at people and Paul Horning being the peak of playing the position of running back if you're in Green Bay. Never mind Jim Brown's the greatest running back who ever lived. Fight me. You just don't do that anymore. It's a math problem now. Now it is, we throw to open space, which is why you're seeing Mike Leach's offense, how Mummy's air raid, come into vogue in several different forms all across football. Everybody runs a version of that scheme as a part of their playbook. And it's because you can take advantage of the spaces open to pass in, right? I mean, we're also looking at running backs and we're going, what is the most inconsequential position in football right now outside of punter? Specialist, And you can even make an argument that your kicker is more valuable than your running back because you don't have a bunch of dudes on your team that can kick field goals, even as I make fun of kickers. You have all all the dudes on your team, ostensibly, could play running back. Okay, In a pinch, Pat McAfee could be dropped back there and he could run the ball. But you ask Todd Gurley to go and make punt, make a kick 40 yards out, probably ain't going to happen. That's 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 what's that's the difference that we're talking about here. So in looking at this, you're going, okay, so so what is it? Is it that people aren't that good at running the ball? No. Actually, people are still pretty good at running the ball. But we also have found that the way that the game is called now, with horse collaring being gone, targeting being at a big point of emphasis, holding calls on the rise, both offensively and defensively, pass interference becoming a bigger part of what you're thinking about when you're playing corner, being called. Illegal contact at the line yeah, of scrimmage. Touch receiver after five yards. Right, yeah. right. That's Those are all part and parcel to why it's easier to throw the ball. And one of the things I'm fascinated by is Tom Brady. Because you're looking at that guy and you're saying, man, that dude has played in an era where there was horse calling. He played in an era where you were not necessarily doing something great if you were throwing the football all over the yard where he was, and now you're in, a, in an era where you got to have a guy that can throw the ball all over the yard to be competitive in the playoffs. And also, Tom Brady, Drew Brees, Aaron Rodgers, a couple other guys, Ben Roethlisberger, get to play further into their careers than anybody else has before because they've never been safer. They've never taken fewer hits. So obviously, they're going to be better at throwing the ball. They don't have to worry about getting blindsided. They don't have to worry about somebody trying to take their head off. Because, right, 
we're going to have to protect them. We're seeing kids get really good at pulling up right before they're about to clean the clock of a quarterback who just released a pass. And as you just pointed out, let Troy Aikman throw that same pass. Let Brett Favre throw that same pass. They're going to get destroyed. You know, how much better would they be at throwing the ball around the yard is what people would ask, to which I say we don't know. We only know that the way that the game is now, as much fun as people want to make of playing 7-on-7, seven seven, that's the way to play the game. The game is 7-on-7. Seven seven. Go ahead. Well, I, I think here's the thing about football. What it's always been since the beginning of time, it's leverage and beating your man in, 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 in space. Now, sometimes that space was seven guys packed on the line of scrimmage. Now we're just saying, look, football is still about me beating you or you beating me. It's just now we're spread out more. I think it's more about, I think you're right, first. Yes, it is more about leverage and beating people in space, but I could say the same thing about basketball. I think the big difference in football as it pertains to any other sport is I can outnumber you. And the way that we match up to things dictates what I'm going to do, right? And you can outnumber people in basketball, but you can also say, you know what we're not going to do? We're not going to let that guy beat us. Whereas football, you try to do that with a wide receiver, yeah, it might work, but that dude could probably still take your top off just by being faster than you. 